Have you ever wondered why the great cathedrals of Europe were built when they were? Or why the Vikings in the Middle Ages were able to create vibrant communities in places you sure wouldn't want to try and farm today? Have you ever wondered why some periods of history become known as Dark Ages, when the crops fail and the invaders swoop in? Well, these are the kinds of questions that historians ask. And the answers, of course, are always complicated. They involve wars, they involve natural disasters, they involve natural blessings, they involve inventions and institutions, they involve the courage and determination that humans are capable of, and also the cruelty and the stupidity. And they involve climate, which is where I come in. I'm John Robson, and I welcome you to the Climate Discussion Nexus video, A Historian Looks at Climate Change. In the period of time that we've been making CDN videos and newsletters, periodically someone will ferret out the apparently scandalous information that I'm a historian and wave it about in triumph. Like this guy who commented on one of our YouTube threads that, quote, he said he was a doctor, but never said in what? Why is that? Oh, I checked. His doctorate is in history. I guess he didn't want us to know that, end quote. Well, if not, I must be pretty stupid because uh, I put it on my online biography. I talked about it at length in my 2017 documentary called The Environment of True Story. And I foolishly announced it in our first CDN video whose YouTube description starts, quote, Welcome, I am Dr. John Robson, a Canadian historian and journalist. Now, I'm not one to hide my credentials. I'm not actually embarrassed that I'm a historian, but I'm also not one to lord it over you because of it. I have no interest in wagging my finger and saying, I have a PhD in history, so I'm an expert, and you have to believe everything I say. We've learned and relearned a few things about experts during the coronavirus crisis. And one of them is that in the face of real uncertainty, experts can be as wrong as everyone else, or even more wrong, because they're more sure of themselves. Another thing that we've learned is that experts and computer models are a dangerous combination. A third, and this to me is the most important, is that when it comes to making major decisions about laws and policies and how we're going to be governed and how we're going to operate as a society, whether it's on climate change, whether it's dealing with a pandemic, how you set up your constitution, experts can offer advice, but the decisions need to be made by the ordinary people whose lives will be affected by the decisions. We need to weigh the relevant factors we need to think about the alternatives, and we need to apply our own common sense. This whole thing about experts, frankly, is a bit fishy. I mean, nobody ever seems to object that Al Gore isn't a climate scientist, or Elizabeth May isn't, or Barack Obama, or Leonardo DiCaprio, certainly not Greta Thunberg. It's highly selective, because they also don't say not to have an opinion on the budget because you're not an accountant or not to have an opinion on taxes because you're not an economist or not to have an opinion on the rise of China because you're not a diplomat or a general or not to have an opinion on Hitler because you're not a historian. On the contrary, just about everybody wants citizens to be engaged, ideally after taking some trouble to inform themselves. And that's exactly right. If it weren't, Democracy would be a terrible idea in principle, because neither voters nor politicians can possibly have an advanced degree on almost any of the subjects that they're expected to make decisions and judgments about. So, if we really believed in this business about experts, we turn everything over to the professoriate instead. Relying on common sense as the essence of self-government instead is a far better idea. And it's an old one. 
There's something that William Pitt the Elder said in the British Parliament in 1770 that I'd like to bring up here. And yes, it's the sort of thing that historians know, like being able to tell you that Millard Fillmore was the 13th president of the United States, and that after leaving office, Fillmore turned down an honorary degree from Oxford because he said he didn't have the sort of distinction that merited an Oxford degree, and moreover, it would be in Latin, and he said, quote, no man should accept a degree he cannot read. A remarkable degree of humility that we could use more of in politicians, by the way. As you see from that example, we historians are a barrel of laughs at parties, but never mind. The point here is that in 1770, Pitt said, quote, There is one plain maxim to which I have invariably adhered through life, that in every question in which my liberty or my property were concerned, I should consult and be determined by the dictates of common sense. I confess, my lords, that I am apt to distrust the refinements of learning, because I have seen the ablest and the most learned of men equally liable to deceive themselves and to mislead others. The condition of human nature would be lamentable indeed if nothing less than the greatest learning and talents, which fall to the share of so small a number of men, were sufficient to direct our judgment and our conduct. But Providence has taken better care of our happiness and given us in the simplicity of common sense a rule for our direction by which we can never be misled." End quote. Now, in case you're not a historian or a climate scientist, I should explain that Pitt Sr. was known as the Great Commoner. He took the side of the colonists before the American Revolution, he exposed corruption in government, and he had a son who, as Prime Minister himself, helped save Britain from Napoleon and under whom Parliament, inspired by William Wilberforce, abolished the slave trade. And yet, amazingly enough, neither of the Pitts nor Wilberforce had a PhD in political science or applied ethics or any other such discipline. So they just had to muddle through. And speaking of muddling through, one virtue of historical training is that you get some understanding of what has been dangerous to self-government in the past and what has helped to save it and preserve liberty. And unfortunately, rule by experts tends to be in the dangerous to self-government column. You might think, well, why not put the best and the brightest in charge? But best in Greek is Aristo, and rule by the best is called aristocracy. Does anyone really want to go back to that system? I would rather take my stand with another historian here, William F. Buckley, who once famously remarked, quote, I'd rather entrust the government of the United States to the first 400 people listed in the Boston Telephone Directory than to the faculty of Harvard University, end quote. Nowadays, it probably helps to have a history degree to know what a telephone directory is, but you get his point. Let me now address the question of why a sense of history, and a PhD in this stuff, is not an impediment to thinking clearly about climate change specifically, but rather is a desirable asset. As historians, we're trained to seek the key to the present and to the future in the past. And so, as soon as man-made global warming became a thing, and I was told that CO2 was going to overheat the planet, I asked myself a natural historian question. I said, is there anything in the past record of the planet to suggest that CO2 drives temperature? If there is, it's reasonable to think it will continue to do so. If not, this is kind of an odd view to take. And I was told CO2 has been stable for thousands of years before industrialization, but temperatures kept changing. So I naturally concluded that there's something else causing them to fluctuate, probably a number of things. And it's not just thousands of years. Look back 50,000 years. Look back 5 million, 50 million, half a billion. It doesn't matter on what scale you look, there just doesn't seem to be any connection between CO2 and temperature which makes it very fishy to claim that it suddenly became the dominant factor right around the time that Pierre Trudeau became Prime Minister of Canada. I'm not alone in thinking the past matters, by the way. 
It's something you're also likely to hear from geologists and earth scientists. For instance, Professor of Earth Environmental Sciences Ian Plymer from Australia, when he was registering serious doubts about climate orthodoxy, began by saying, I'm a geologist, and the one thing that we miss out on in looking at climate change is the past, end quote. I heartily agree, and leaving out the past is not a small thing. How would we try to judge anything from politics to geopolitics to our own personal conduct if we had no knowledge of what had happened in the past? So this whole notion of CO2 as the climate control knob, as NASA once really did put it, strikes me as very suspicious because it hasn't been that way before. And incidentally, it's too bad Al Gore's not a historian because in an inconvenient truth, he famously laid two charts of CO2 and temperature over the last 700,000 years atop one another, and he went, gotcha, but it was actually a horrendous gaffe. They do correlate more closely than one normally finds, at least in the sense of being small waves on top of bigger ones. But the problem is in those small waves, it's temperature that moves first, and CO2 follows with a lag of around 800 years. And on that basis, let me toss out an intriguing possibility for more research rather than a dogmatic claim. But if it is true that a warming Earth tends to degas from the oceans, and a cooling one tends to absorb CO2 into the oceans, well, what was happening about 800 years before the present? Right, the medieval warm period. So what we could be seeing now is the carbon cycle going into a long accumulating phase as a typically delayed reaction to that warming. It's just speculation, but if it is true, it would at least be consistent with what we know of the past, unlike Al Gore's view that CO2 drives temperature changes 800 years after the fact. You're not going to find a lot of scientists thinking that effect can precede cause any more than you will historians. Now, speaking of the medieval warm period, again, as a historian, the moment I saw Michael Mann's infamous hockey stick, I said, hey, what happened to the Middle Ages? I've known ever since I was just a small historian. And by the way, if being a historian is a shame, it's a family shame, because my mother was a historian and so was my grandfather. So I've known since I was quite young that the Middle Ages was characterized by warmth, by abundant harvests, and by the kind of cultural and geopolitical conditions that led to a flowering of arts and other institutions. That's when the great cathedrals were built. That's when universities were invented. That's when hospitals appeared. And it's also earlier in that period when the Vikings made their voyages of discovery, which I grant you were a mixed blessing to the people they discovered and then stole their stuff and burned down their villages. But it also got them to Iceland and Greenland before falling temperatures wiped out the settlements in the latter. And there's more here. You see, when it became cold in the 14th century, as the medieval warm period started giving way to the Little Ice Age, and this cooling is captured in the paintings of Peter Bruegel the Elder and a number of other artists, the crops failed. The Black Death came and it was a disaster. So again, I looked at Michael Mann's hockey stick and I said, where's the medieval warm period and why do we think warming is bad? On which subject? A few years ago, when I was making uh, The Environment A True Story, I had the good fortune to be able to interview Princeton University physicist Will Happer, who is well known for his path-breaking work in atmospheric science and for his descent from global warming orthodoxy. I discovered that in addition to being a distinguished scientist, he also knows a lot about the historical evidence for the medieval warm period. He talked about the records of tithing to monasteries, which give you ideas of where crops were being grown and in what quantities. He talked about where tree lines were in the Middle Ages versus where they were centuries later. And in both cases, it was clear that warmth meant that plants grew better, including food crops. Which means, you know, whatever you think of crop failure, there's really no question of the medieval warm period having existed. And, you know, as a historian, I just know it's, it's not even controversial. Books on art history talk about the medieval warm period just as it's essentially uncontroversial that the Dark Ages were colder, and it's one reason they were dark. Or that before that, there was a Roman warm period. There was also a Minoan warm period. There was a Holocene climate optimum. And then if you go back into the Pleistocene and you look at the glaciations, you see a cycle of brief warm periods, which are nice, and long cold ones that aren't. So yes, History tells us that temperatures fluctuate, and it tells us, yes, they have been rising since Victorian times. 
But again, a historian says, well, of course they have. It's a natural rebound from the Little Ice Age. It's part of a cycle of these coolings and warmings. And so it's illogical to attribute all the warming since 1860 or well, 1970 to human influences, though the Thames would probably still be freezing if it weren't for that wretched Henry Ford. And here's another historically based question about climate change. Whenever I hear people saying, we're seeing levels of atmospheric CO2 unmatched in the last two and a half million years, my inclination is to say, okay, well, what happened last time they were at this level? You're telling me it's gonna to lead to runaway warming, but I look back and I see that last time it happened, the warm and lush Pliocene abruptly gave way to the chilly and barren Pleistocene, a prolonged ice age that we're actually still in because the definition of an ice age is significant polar ice. Fortunately, we're in one of those hospitable interglacials called the Holocene. Though, again, judging by past patterns, the Holocene is winding down, not up. And if it is, we're in a world of hurt that we can't fix by spraying CO2 around because it's just not the control knob on the global thermometer. The historical record makes that abundantly clear. Now, as a historian, I employ my expertise to caution you here that reconstructions of temperature and atmospheric CO2 become increasingly speculative and unreliable as we go back. But this chart, which I used in my documentary, shows what we think temperature and CO2 might have been like going back essentially to the Cambrian explosion, the appearance of multi-celled life on Earth. And let me tell you, no historian no scientist, no intelligent lay voter would ever look at these lines and say, ah, yes, well, clearly the red one is driving the blue one. And yes, even if you're neither a historian nor a climate scientist, don't let anybody tell you you lack the qualifications to look at this chart and see the obvious. Now, I will concede one point here about the role of experts. If a question is purely technical, if it doesn't have political or social implications, and it really is settled, then I'm all in favor of deferring to them. If we want to know the hundredth digit of pi, let's ask a mathematician or some high school kid who's memorized the thing. If we need to know how far it is from Earth to Jupiter, let's ask an astronomer. But climate science is not in that category. It's a field that's wide open to debate in which there is massive disagreement and in which both scientists and activists know that various people's views on how CO2 affects the climate have big implications for public policy. It's a prize worth capturing. Let me say this bluntly, far too many climate scientists spend their days on Twitter making their political views known for the rest of us to believe they're just neutral. And when climate alarmists tell us quote, believe the scientists, end quote, what they really have in mind is that we should believe the scientists who share their political views and make it clear that they share them on social media. And if you somehow don't believe that scientists have political views that can affect what they research and how they do their science, well, that's a history lesson for another day. I won't mention Lysenko here. Meanwhile, the next time some Sherlock discovers that I'm a historian and says, ha, gotcha, you shouldn't have an opinion on climate change, I answer with William Pitt that everyone should have an opinion on climate change. It doesn't matter what kind of formal training you have, because you're being asked to make judgments and major decisions on it as a voter and as a citizen. If you think your opinion's no good, try harder, because we need you to think, talk, and vote sensibly on it. By all means, listen to the experts, including historians like me, and make a point of listening to people on all sides of the debate. But when you've done that, think for yourself, make up your own mind, and don't let anybody tell you you can't come in because you don't have a PhD in physics. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, I'm a historian, and I'm proud of it. <laughs>